So Kelly, do you just want to get right into it? Sure. All right, so my hope today really is to just do a bit of it, really an introduction to AI. Um, we want to start taking a look at artificial intelligence and what can that do for nonprofits. And I think the the idea is that in the nonprofit space, we're often confronted with um, more restrictions in terms of how much uh, funding is available for things, not always uh, the, the largest staffs or um, some of the circumstances are less than ideal. And then there are also lots of areas within the, the nonprofit NGO world that uh, can really make use of artificial intelligence for things like disaster recovery and so forth. So it's really an important space for artificial intelligence. Oftentimes what we see is the nonprofit space is later to the uh, to the table when it comes to, to newer innovations, just because of time, resources, and so forth. But it's this is one where I feel like nonprofits really need to get out, um, right out of the gate with, with everyone else. So we're gonna cover an introduction today, and then on future sessions, we will most likely um, discuss some of the examples and some of the ideas, even a bit of learning in more detail. So this is really, um, a part of a much broader series on this topic coming up. So what I mean when I talk about artificial intelligence, we've been hearing this term for a long, long time. Uh, there are millions of definitions, um, but essentially I kind of like to take a, a few pieces from a, a few different ways of looking at it. Um, one is applying a set of rules or other mechanisms for the purpose of making inference based on data. And so this is really looking at the old kind of concept of algorithms that you're using, right? So you have something that's um, got a set of rules and it's going to go through a data set and it's gonna make decisions um, based on that. And then if also, of course, it's technology that enables computers and digital devices to, to learn, read, write, create, and analyze. So really it's technology that is allowing, I guess, for some of the more repetitive tasks or time-consuming tasks that humans would typically do, putting those over on the, the technology side of things, enabling humans to work on things that AI really can't do as well, and certainly not at this stage, things that uh, require a, a different kind of thinking. And then, of course, um, training technology for the tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and translation. So you'll notice that it's got things that are um, that are a, a more, um, I guess, uh, wired for the computer world as opposed to um, something like uh, emotion or making inferences based on, on somebody's the, the, the emotion that um, somebody is experiencing and so forth. Not really there for those kinds of things, but things like if you think about translation between languages, if you've ever gone out online and you've typed in a word and it's shot a word back to you, it's doing that translation using some form of learning that the, the machine has done. And the same with if you've done, um, if you have a, a face ID or um, face access to your iPhone, for example. That's another case where it might be doing that. And of course, speech recognition that's been around forever. So all forms of artificial intelligence, I think some of it's been around for a long time. It's definitely getting more um, complex and more layered. Um, another term you'll hear oftentimes related to artificial intelligence is going to be machine learning. And this is really a subfield of artificial intelligence. So it's kind of broadly defined as the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. And what you're doing is we're going to talk about that, but the machine is learning. You're using methods to actually train that machine um, to perform those tasks that could be done normally by humans. So you'll hear a lot of other things, and we'll go into more deal detail in, in later webinars about um, models that are used, large language models, things like that that you might hear as well. But for now, just wanted to point out, you'll, yeah, you'll hear artificial intelligence. You also hear machine learning, and machine learning is kind of that subfield of AI, a very common one. Uh, and then, of course, two other things that you'll hear related to AI commonly would be Copilot and ChatGPT. So that ChatGPT is a language-based, and here's the GPT, generative pre-training transformer. Um, it's really a... A mechanism for for you to be able to type things in and have the um, the GPT go out and perform tasks for you. Oftentimes, what it's doing is it it can go out and do things like create programs. So it can code, it can 
um, pull together recipes. There have been some great fails in this area as well um, because these, these models are new or these tools are new. So in terms of chat GPT, if I put a bunch of ingredients in and say, okay, find a recipe for me, um, sometimes it might find something um, that works and sometimes it might not. Uh, so they're definitely a work in progress. And the idea being that they are being, they're kind of training as they go. And Copilot is a Microsoft productivity tool that's gonna use AI. And this is really, um, if you've heard of Bing GPT or Bing Chat GPT, um, that's kind of been rolled into Copilot. Uh, Copilot, you'll see it's kind of described as a as a chatbot, but it does a lot of other things. So this is going to be built into your Microsoft applications, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then um, perhaps at later dates go into more detail with that one. So the AI, artificial intelligence, can really be, um, typically it's going to be either descriptive, predictive, or prescriptive. Um, so you've got descriptive AI is going to be, hey, what happened? So if I need something to go through and um, do an analysis of, of data to determine um, what happened over a period of time, maybe something in financial data or something like that, that's going to be more of a descriptive. Um, sometimes it's going to use language so I can have it go through that as well and put together some descriptive. But it's really essentially describing something that occurred, whereas a predictive artificial intelligence model is going to say, hey, what's going to happen? And that's where you have things like forecasting, right? So it's going to go through data and it's going to see um, what what is it, what does it think is going to happen based on the information that it has available. So if you, you can th kind of think about, we've had some of this, particularly with things like forecasting and so forth for a, a long time, right? We're using those inputs and um, and then making a determination based on what we have, a best get guess determination. And it is using, as we know in AI, it's going to use those algorithms or those rules that have been defined. And then of course, prescriptive is gonna be a what should I do, right? So that one's going to look at, um, that's going to look at the data set and then make a decision about, hey, what should you do based on what it's seeing there? So it's going to prescribe an action based on what it, um, the, the information or the data it has. So keeping in mind that these are really all data-based activities, right? They're looking through lots and lots of data to uh, make these decisions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that learning piece shortly. Um, so the real purpose of when we take those predictive, prescriptive, descriptive models and say, hey, you know, what is the point of that? Why, why am I going to do this? Really, it's working within that confluence of people, processes, and technology. So if I think about uh, something like I, there are certain things that people do that I certainly don't want my AI doing, right? And there are certain things that um, technology hey, technology might be able to handle, but does it really belong there in the AI world? And that's an important thing to keep in mind. So I've got people, people are doing things based on processes. Is technology actually a good fit? You don't wanna create a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. So the idea is really to take those things where you're, where you can gain efficiencies. First, look at what are some of your pain points? What are the problems that need to be solved? before you start developing things just for the sake of developing them. And of course, as you're getting in and you're learning how to use uh, some of the, the AI tools, sure, make things up, do things um, that may, might not be that helpful just to have fun and just to learn. But ultimately, you're really gonna wanna work within that area of what is optimizing your people, your processes and technology, your optimal use of, of your resources that you have available. Um, what what would you rather your staff be doing than some of the repetitive tasks they might be doing uh, so that you can think about okay how do we replace some of those things or just how do we how do we get even a little bit more time in individuals days for whatever reason you might want that so it's important always always like to emphasize and this goes for any technology implementation to not do technology for the sake of technology make sure you're actually solving a problem or you're getting some value out of what it is that you're creating. So I'm going to look for a problem that I have and then I'm gonna start thinking about will artificial intelligence or some form of that 
actually facilitate the, the solution for this. And this is where you start thinking about um, what tools are available out there. Um, but I'm going to talk first then about how to train your AI. So these are ways that artificial intelligence is trained. Um, they're essentially just recognized three different learning models. So you'll have a supervised learning, which is going to train with labeled data sets, and it just allows models to learn and, and they grow more accurate over time. But essentially, you've got an input A and an output B. So like we said, that language translation. I'm typing a word in one language and I'm getting something to come back to me in another language. Um, that is going to be that supervised learning. It, it's getting those uh, labeled data sets and then working within those. Now in an unsupervised learning model, you're going to look for patterns in unlabeled data. So this is really, if you think about, if you've done statistics, um, this is kind of the way I think about it is in some of those uh, statistical methods that you would use for categorization, some of the, um, the things that are really going to look for clusters of things, for patterns, for things that are repeated, um, stuff like that in unlabeled data. So there is no, nothing that's saying that, hey, this is word um, A and this is word B, the input output. This is just an entire slew of data where you need it to go look for um, patterns. And then, of course, the reinforcement learning. If you've taken psychology, this is kind of that uh, standard learning that you learn about a bit in psychology. It's going to train the machines through trial and error to take the best action. And it actually establishes a, we quote unquote, reward system with the machine. So you're actually having it go through trial and error. It's going to, for example, I type something in that I want it to look for. And it's going to say, you know, how did I do? Was Did this meet your needs, right? You'll see that a lot of times online with things like, um, you know, did you find this article helpful? So if I've searched on something and it's returning, yes, I think this is what you're looking for. It's going to ask me, hey, was that the right thing? I'm going to let it know yes. And then over time, it gradually gets that fine-tuned. Um, this is another reason you'll see sometimes in, in um, the AI world, things can vary a bit um, and you can have the same two people typing in the same things, for example, in a chat GPT or in some other area, and they'll get a couple of different options. And I've done this in a class where we were working on, I think it was ingredients for recipes and we typed in our ingredients, we submitted that and everybody got different things back. So it's not coming back to everybody with the same things. This is where it is kind of evolving in those ways. So there are certain ways that you can use it. And we're gonna talk about some examples of things uh, shortly, but there are a few different ways that you can use it that are going to be probably a little bit safer now, as opposed to some of the things you might do um, that, you know, just as more experimental for the time being, as it gets up to, um, I guess, as it starts to build up to a le level of um, integrity in terms of the responses and so forth over time. And so for that, I just want to talk about a couple of areas, some simple examples, beginner friendly AI, where you have AI that's already built into things. So for this, I'm going to start here with just my Power Automate. So in Power Automate, and this is one where we had done this test in a group of a couple hundred people, and it was largely responded with the same thing, but, um, you know, it was uh, a couple people had some things that were a little different. So I'm just gonna start a cloud flow and I can just call this one test. And we'll just skip that for now. So what you're gonna use when you're working in Power Automate, and you're gonna see this throughout the Microsoft uh, applications, you'll see Copilot. And so this is my Copilot window. Um, if you're not seeing that, you can come up here and you'll have a, an option to show it if it isn't showing. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna actually tell it what you want it to do with the flow. So I can ask a question or describe how I want it to modify an existing flow. But I could just come in here and see, create a workflow, I can spell it, that um, requires approval and sends an email with the result. And so what you're gonna do is it's gonna go ahead and create that for you. 
Now, obviously, you're going to need to come in here and you're going to need to do some additional work on it, but it's going to create that beginning of that workflow for you. So instead of me coming in and manually, as you would kind of do in the old days, hey, it was great once we had the workflows and you could sort of just say, okay, I know I need a trigger and then I need an action from that and maybe a condition and responses. But now it's going to start that whole layout for me. So I could come in and I can, I can add my trigger for here. I've got to start. And I've got to say, okay, what kind of approval hey, we're going to make this? Go ahead. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just want to make sure that we're all seeing what you're showing because it sounds like really oh. great information. Um, oh, are you gosh. doing a demo right now? I am. I went over to the screen oh, and no I did problem. not. Good grief. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. Let we me start We want to see screen. all this great stuff you're talking about. So <laughs> we can't miss that. It's just terrible to not actually see it. Yeah. All right. But you're describing so it I very am, well. So I'm working right, over here go. in my Power Automate. So I think we'll do this again. And um, so what I am doing in my Power Automate is I am creating a new flow here. I'm going to just say this is going to be an automated cloud flow. I'm going to give it a name. And we'll just skip the rest of what's there. And this is where, again, I was mentioning, and hopefully everyone's seeing it now, um, you've got Copilot over on the right side of the screen. If you don't have it for whatever reason, you can always enable that if it's not showing, if that pane is not showing. But here's where I'm really going to ask the questions. Um, so I can either ask a question, uh, describe how I want the flow to work, or if I have something that already exists, I can actually have it um, append or modify an existing flow. So I think I was doing the create a work. That requires approval and sends an email with the results. All right, and so this is what where the Copilot AI is working. Um, you'll notice it's going to have suggestions for other actions that you might put in here. So the interesting thing is the one that I had done that you couldn't see just before, it actually had a condition piece, a yes, no. And this is what we noticed when we did that um, as a group, when we had hundreds of people type something in that was similar at the same time. Um, it, in some cases, would create that yes, no branch, and in some cases it didn't. So those are things that you'll want to look for. Um, but what you're going to do in here is you're just going to come out and you're going to make sure that you're taking care of any of the parameters, right? So what kind of approval do I want this to be? Um, and then, of course, parameters for this. So the um, ID of the approval, which is not. Um, so I would come out here and I'm going to make sure I've got whatever pieces I need there for the waiting for approval. And then, of course, sending that email who do I want that email to go to, right? So you're still learning some of those pieces that are um, that, you, that you have to know to be able to create a Power Automate workflow, right? So that doesn't go away and that's an okay thing. It's, it's pretty easy to, once you get in there and you start creating flows, it's pretty easy to get familiar with the things that are required and Microsoft has plenty of documentation on that. Um, but the big thing here is to just know that you don't need to actually create that shell anymore that you needed to create. Now you just start that in your co-pilot and have it go from there to create those workflows. So that's one context or one example of a place that I just think is just a, a great area to use that artificial intelligence, and in that case, it's in the form of Copilot. Another area that you can use it is if you are using, for example, Business Central, and you'll see this across the Microsoft Dynamics um, environment, that Dynamics uh, 365, the Business Central, the Finance Supply Chain, the CE CRM side of things, you will also have lots of opportunities to use artificial intelligence. And the one in the Business Central area, there are a few areas that they've actually started moving more towards the, the AI world, and that's things like um, a late payment predictor. So it's going to use data, data sets of, the, of your customers and the receivables to determine if the payments are more likely to be late, right? So it's going to do some predictive 
pieces there. You also have some predictive options in the sales and inventory forecasting piece, and you have some um, predictive pieces in the sales or in the cash flow forecasts. And so you'll notice that as you go into something like um, cash flow forecasts here, I'm going to work with, a, I can create whatever forecasts I want, but I'm going to work with a cash flow forecast and uh, create the worksheet and so forth. But in the setup, for that, as well as in the sales and inventory forecast, you'll see the, the setup piece is going to have connectability to an Azure AI model. And so what you're doing is in this case, I'm connecting to Azure AI. I've got a specific um, you know, project or uh, solution that's out there. And as you get, and as we go through more of these um, webinars discussing this, you'll get familiar with kind of how those how that looks out in the Azure AI world as well. But um, you're going to actually there's just a few quick steps to setting this up, but you're really just generating a URL and an API key. And those are going to come back here. And from there, I can select, you know, what is my time series model for things? Um, the One of the big things is make sure you've got it set to Azure AI enabled so that when it goes out, it's actually going to go out and use that model for you. But that's another area. Uh, one other area within Business Central, where there are a couple of other areas on the on the bank account reconciliation, it's using more AI now. There's also on your items, for example, if I have items and I've got them set up with dimensions, I can actually use or uh, with attributes, I can use um, some AI within the items to uh, go ahead and do some market, um, create some marketing text for those items. So I'm just going to look for something in here. Um, we'll just look at my little Amsterdam lamp. This is the one I use the most. But if the, you'll notice a box over in Business Central, again, this is just another area where this is available. I've got um, item attributes set up for something. And you do have a market, marketing text area where you can draft with Copilot. Drafting with Copilot is going to be a, become a bigger thing even over on things like the Microsoft Word side where you can create documents and do things with Copilot. So this is another one. This is a little bit different than using a predictive model like we see with some of the other ones. Um, this is going to you know take information that it sees here and it's going to create some text for me for that item card. So that's another great use on the AI side. Of course, over in Business Central. Another place that you see this, if we go to our Outlook and you work with um, the emails that you have created for customers, it's going to integrate with your business central so i can have this pull up my business central um, contact insights which for, there we go um, i can have it pull up those contact insights for me and um, from within there it's going to pull that customer up but the great thing about this what i really like is it's going to work through when you have for example we'll come down to this one i've got these um four amsterdam lamps i've got the number in here business central and uh, is going to work with artificial intelligence here right within my outlook to create a sales order for me so this is a great way when you have those customer contact emails in the system and you're sending and receiving emails, you're gonna be able to get right to that customer card. And the same applies on the vendor side, right here within Outlook. And then I have all that full functionality that I already have over in the application itself. And if I come out here to create something like a sales order, it's really going to look through this text and try to make a decision based on what it sees there. So you can see that it put a quantity of four here in my Amsterdam lamp because it's identifying that and that seems like the most plausible solution for it. So I can go ahead and click OK there and it's going to create that sales order for me. So again, this is not another um, kind of mechanism for that artificial intelligence. So I'm able to come down here. I can see I've got my item right there and it's working just as if I were in Business Central. I can release that document 
and it's going to be sitting right there in my business central for me. So some other things that you can do, I just like to point out lots of other things you can do over here on the, um, the Outlook side even with in conjunction with the Dynamics applications and artificial intelligence. All right, so I need to get back to my screen. Okay. So looking at kind of the forecast piece, a little bit more of the BC side of things and then some Power Automate, there's also the use of Copilot across the system. So where we see things like um, using um, what we saw in the contact insights and some of the business central functionality that's integrated with Outlook, you also have the ability to do a lot of those kinds of things um, in Word, more Outlook functionality than we're seeing, um, more PowerPoint. If you've ever, if you've gone out, it'll, it can make PowerPoint suggestions of how you want to set up your um, PowerPoint presentation, things that you might want to add to your presentation. It can do a lot of things in Excel for you. Teams is the place where we see this. Teams and Outlook are kind of two places where from a productivity standpoint, even for users just going in, we've been experimenting a bit more with things like having it do a, um, a quick analysis of what transpired in a meeting. So you can have Copilot work with you. You can have an, even have Copilot if you get into a meeting um, late you can have Copilot give you a quick summary on what you've missed so far, right? So um, it, it can do those kinds of things for you. It can do a lot of that summary stuff. And if you think about um, a kind of an earlier version of all of that, think about when you started using Teams and you would do the, um, it would transcribe for you. So you're recording and transcribing. It's taking care of that transcription for you. Well, it's just one step further to go through and actually take that next, um, you know, that leap over to summarizing. So now it can work through that and summarize data. And again, a lot of times it's gonna use learning models. So if, if um, something's asking you how it did, it's you know not just asking because it's looking for a compliment, it's gonna, going to be asking really because it's trying to train that model. Um, so Copilot, uh, Microsoft Copilot is one that I would love to explore a bit more um, in the future with our nonprofit partners, just some of those ways that you could really increase your productivity. Um, other things, you know, if you think about with Copilot, a lot of the, even we looked a bit at that um, Power Automate piece, that is, um, you know, that's kind of in a similar vein is that, that Power Automate there. And I realized that I am still showing this screen Turn that off for now. All right. So um, in any case, um, yeah, so the Power Automate's using a bit of that. Your chat bots, of course, that have been around for quite a while. Um, that is obviously Power Virtual Agent, as it, as it was once called. That was kind of a, an early precursor, of course, to some of this AI stuff, right? Making decisions about it. it's receiving things in. You've set up some instructions for what it needs to do in different situations, and the computer is going to go ahead and, and do some of its own thinking to get through it. Some other areas, um, and this is we're going to talk a little bit about some of the resources, but some of the areas where you, I think, on, from the nonprofit, the NGO side, where we've seen you know great success with things is things like wildfires. So they've gotten to um, points where they can set up cameras, cameras built with some mechanisms of artificial intelligence that, that can then identify wildfires before they begin, right? So we've got a wildfire fire or a wildfire, wildfire that is just starting. You can actually set it up so that it's going to identify and then notify. So the fire department gets notified before the fire even, even gets moving. It's They've found that they've got a much faster turnaround time and much more success with things um, that way. There's also drought prediction. Um, so predicting drought can be extremely helpful in terms of food. So in areas where they have um, insufficient amount of food or uh, are food constrained, being able to predict drought at least allows the opportunity to get a bit ahead of it, right? So you can actually come up with alternative solutions and ways to get through that. And they've used it in things like hurricanes and earthquakes. So disaster um, management 
with um, earthquakes, where being able to identify or find people, finding missing people is a is a big piece of one of the things, um, as well as even in uh, some scenarios, setting up the ability to communicate emergency information and so forth. So a lot of that is using artificial intelligence to do some of those things. And we'll go into more um, detail on some of those models at a later time. Finally, I just want to talk a bit about, before we go to some of our resources that are available, uh, about the approach for this. So the real, as I mentioned, the real thing to keep in mind is creating something that is going to solve a problem, right? So consider your people and processes and identify solutions around problems related to those to those resources, right? Um, look th for things that are repetitive. Are you doing duplicate entry? Are things you know overly time consuming? Use those as maybe some markers for processes that that um, might be fixable through some form of artificial intelligence. Um, explore the solutions for fit. Does AI actually add value? So look at things like your um, power automate. So workflows, is that something that you would add? Chat GPT for doing things like drafting um, text for something or um, even research you can use that for or some of the other things that um, that we'll talk about over time, but look for the, the fit of those solutions and whether or not they add value and then think about your resources. Do you use internal staff or do you use external support for those? Are there opportunities to upskill employees? Um, I would say that you probably wanna start thinking in advance about getting some of the staff more excited about artificial intelligence before you really start jumping into that area. And you can even consider it in the form of things like Power Automate or Copilot or some of these things without throwing out artificial intelligence right out of the gate. You're probably going to want to use some of those pre-built solutions that are already out there just to to get your um, to get yourself started before you jump into, for example, building some of the things. And then, of course, creating your solution, drafting the solution, documenting the process. So, and my solution might just be something like I'm pulling data in from through a Power Automate, I'm having it, um, I'm having it come into my Power Automate area, gets in there, that kicks off another trigger that does something else. So that can be a solution that's going to um, sort of optimize perhaps time. Um, but again, it's a solution based on something that's already kind of pre-built for you, one of those beginner friendly types of things. The uh, key is gonna be making sure you develop and test because even no matter how, uh, regardless of how much uh, a tool is built for something, you're gonna wanna, as we saw with the Power Automate, make sure that it, the flow is correct for you and it's got the conditions and all of the things you need. And uh, that's gonna go for any kind of artificial intelligence you're using because you've gotta keep in mind, these models are still learning, right? Um, and then finally, you want to evaluate. So how does we've developed and tested? How does that solution work? Was it a match? Is it something that we're going to continue using? Um, in terms of resources, this, I think, is just one of the things I really wanted to point out. Um, there's so many resources available, so many resources on artificial intelligence in general, and then resources um, specific to even for nonprofit uh, communities, and that's I think what's it's great to see how much Microsoft sees um, recognizes the need for something like this. So uh, some links that I've got here, there um, is a link, of course, to the Copilot. There's also a Microsoft, and I think it's here. Let me get back to my uh, screen. Share my screen. Um, there is. All right, there is a Microsoft uh, training in things like Copilot. So I am a big fan of these um, learn.microsoft.com class. You have training paths and so forth, but this is a great one that's got all kinds of different uh, modules available related to Copilot. So you've got your um, introduction, you're getting started and so forth. And then of course, within each one of these, it's got um, a wealth of information, but it's going to take you through a lot of those different options for how you can use Copilot in um, the different areas within the system. Um, and of course, this is where you'll see things like um, 
you know, using it in Word and Excel and Outlook and so forth. So there's a, a wealth of training out there. Again, this is um, in the learn.microsoft.com, one of my favorites. Um, another area from a training standpoint, if you haven't used any of the massive um, uh, education forums out there, the mass education forums, MOOCs, the, um, like Coursera and edX, I strongly recommend popping out and taking a look at those. Um, on Coursera and edX, they have just a lot of different options for AI learning. And so you've got um, even deep learning specializations, machine learning specializations. This AI for good is a specialization that I really like. Um, the AI forever one is also a good precursor even to this. But the AI for good is going to cover disaster management. Um, it's going to cover public health. So it's got a few areas that that within that specialization, it's got um, three different in individual um, classes. And one is you know going to be this disaster management, public health, and there's another one in there as well. Um, some of the other tools I really like are um, or things that I like out there that I just suggest taking a look at are looking well. The Microsoft Partner account over here. Um, there is a blog, so I have the link to this as well. So this blog for introducing Microsoft um, 365 Copilot. Uh, this is a great one out here, and this is on that blog world. And then, of course, um, some things about nonprofit solutions specific to Microsoft. And this one is really just a wonderful um, area that has all kinds of things in here. So you can see you've got an AI assessment um, and then they've got examples for different things. So some really great things there. As you move through this, these different areas, you're gonna notice that it's got, um, you're gonna be linked to other, other things as well. This nonprofit community blog through Microsoft is a great blog for getting different ideas. This one, the AI for Nonprofits Taking the First Steps is one of my favorites um, because it's gonna walk through some of the free tools that you have available, some of the different areas that are a good place to start as a nonprofit. So this uh, specific blog, I think I have the link for that one in there. Um, and then also this nonprofit community just overall over on the um, tech community at the Microsoft.com. Very useful. Um, and then I think this one, yes, uh, this one we was just a, just a great little graphic of um, decisions you can make about building AI solutions and what kind of learning is going to be used and so forth. But that's something that we'll dive into a little bit more in the future. So again, you've got a, some really good classes on edX and Coursera lots of links through the Microsoft world, some great blogs out there. Um, highly recommend spending some time visiting some of those resources.